America's massive debt bubble is on the verge of collapse, something that could cause a big recession and push interest rates and inflation even higher into the future. A situation that Jamie Dimon, the CEO of JP Morgan, is getting very concerned about, who's warning that this is the most dangerous time for the world in decades, because not only do we have military conflicts in Ukraine and Israel, we also have burgeoning national debt and the largest peacetime deficits ever that are raising the risk that inflation and interest rates remain high. With our country now owing over $33 trillion in debt, which is a 40% increase from its levels prior to the pandemic and a 200% increase from what it was back in 2008 before the last big crash. Now, all of a sudden, these rising debt levels are not looking so sustainable, which is now causing some people to think maybe we're not gonna pay it back. With Fitch recently downgrading the United States debt rating, arguing that there's going to be an expected fiscal deterioration over the next three years due to a high and growing government debt burden, and the result of this debt downgrade to go along with all the new debt our government is issuing is a big increase in interest rates. For America now to get people to buy all the debt, they have to give a higher return on the debt, which is why treasury yields are surging and why mortgage rates are surging. The 30-year fixed mortgage rate is now over 7.5% and could potentially hit 8% by the end of the year. And these sky-high mortgage rates, they're absolutely destroying activity in the housing market. With mortgage applications to buy a house collapsing by 50% from their peak in the pandemic down to now the lowest level that we've seen since 1994. Five. That's right, folks. Home buyer demand is at its lowest level in 28 years due to sky high mortgage rates as well as sky high home prices. Home prices adjusted for inflation. They're at the highest levels on record. They've come down by a little bit, but you can see home prices, they're still higher than they were in the 06 bubble and they're about 90% above what the long-term 130 year average is for inflation adjusted home prices. Which now begs an interesting question. What's the bigger drag on the housing market right now. Why are you not buying a house? Is it because home prices are too high or is it because mortgage rates are too high? And later in this video, I'm gonna reveal the answer to that question. I polled you guys asking what you think the bigger issue in the housing market is. But ultimately, I think the thing you gotta understand right now if you're a home buyer investor is that we are unlikely to see relief on mortgage and interest rates anytime soon, given how much money the government is borrowing. We are running a $1.8 trillion deficit right now, which is a near record deficit. Outside of the pandemic, when we printed all that money, we have never run a deficit this high in America, especially not during a time of relative economic stability and relative world peace. There are some conflicts in the world right now, but we don't have a massive world war going on. So why is the US government still borrowing so much money. Because now we're in what's called a debt spiral in America where we issue more debt and then we have to now pay more interest on the debt, which causes us to have to take out more debt. To understand what I'm talking about here with the interest payments on the debt, look at this graph, everyone. You can see that for the last 25 years or so when we were taking out more debt, the interest payments that the US government had to make on the debt, they actually didn't really go up that much due to declining interest rates. However, that is now all changing. The interest on the debt has now almost doubled over the last three years up to 910 billion. And now actually 15% of the US budget get spent on interest costs. 15% of your tax dollars are just going to pay interest on the debt. In addition, 45% of our budget is on social transfer spending, which is basically going to social security and Medicare. So we have 15% of our budget on interest, 45% on Social Security and Medicare. That means 60% total on non-negotiable items that are gonna keep going up into the future due to higher interest rates as well as the aging of the US population. What does that mean, everyone? That means there's no easy solution to this conundrum of burgeoning debt levels. That's why Jamie Dimon warned that we're in dangerous times right now. In fact, he said that he's been warning JP Morgan's clients about the possibility that interest rates might not only stay elevated, but could also rise significantly from here, which is bad news for the housing market, everyone. Because if interest rates stay higher for longer or go up more into the future, it's going to mean an even further collapse in home buyer demand and mortgage demand. The housing market is in dire straits right now 
and a lot of the people in the industry, they are now starting to get very, very concerned. In fact, the National Association of Realtors, the Mortgage Bankers Association, and the National Association of Home Builders just sent a letter to the Fed and Jerome Powell warning them, housing industry now urging Jerome Powell to stop raising interest rates or risk an economic hard landing. These real estate trade groups are conveying profound concern about the industry right now and are asking the Fed to not contemplate further rate hikes to ensure that the housing sector does not precipitate the hard landing that the Fed is trying hard to avoid. Because the housing market, everyone, is over 15% of our GDP. The real estate sector is over 15% of the GDP. So if the real estate sector in terms of activity is at the lowest level in 30 years, you can bet that likely at some point we're gonna see a spillover into the broader economy that causes a recession, not potentially just a run of the mill recession, but a bad recession. So this is what the National Association of Realtors is warning the Federal Reserve about. And one thing the National Association of Realtors is looking at in particular is the number of realtors there are in America. The number of realtors in America is still near a record high. The number of realtors in America is down by 1.3% year over year. Realtors have started to quit. But as you can see, there's still about 50% more realtors than there are compared to the long-term historical average. And I want to point you to what happened back in the last crash. You can see the number of realtors surged, much like it surged over the last couple of years, and then it peaked in 06, 07, and then crashed down during the bust. Now, what's interesting is we haven't seen that crash in the number of realtors yet. However, it's coming because the number of home sales per realtor is only 2.3 per year. Literally the lowest level of home sale activity for realtors ever, meaning the average realtor only sells 2.3 houses per year and earns about $46,000 in commission, that's the average realtor. Most realtors are earning below that. And what I wonder everyone is if the number of realtors in America, if this is an analogy for the economy overall, and that there's lots of people and lots of businesses really struggling right now, like realtors are really struggling. There's also lots of large businesses and small businesses struggling, losing money, but they haven't quit yet. They haven't done layoffs. They haven't fired people. They're still trying, which is why our uh, unemployment rate is only 3.8%. It's still near a record low, but at some point, when the realtors do quit, and when the companies finally do start laying off workers, it's likely gonna happen very, very fast, and we're gonna see big increases in the unemployment rate and a big decline in consumer spending, and potentially a vicious cycle downward that could lead to a disinflationary or deflationary recession, which is ultimately what the economy needs right now, everyone. The prices of things in the economy, whether they're goods or services or houses or apartment rents, they're too high right now relative to people's incomes. And this is a situation that can't last. If things are too expensive and people can't afford them, there's only so long the economy can go before there's a rebalancing act that pushes prices down and or wages up. And right now we are actually seeing a lot of workers try to get a better wage. I'm sure you guys have seen all the strikes that are occurring across America right now. We have people in Hollywood striking who are actors and writers. We have healthcare workers striking for Kaiser Permanente. We have one of the biggest auto worker strikes of all time with Barron's reporting that this is now the biggest year for worker strikes. 18 million workers have done a strike so far this year. That's the biggest year since 2000 and basically the biggest year going back to the 1970s during our last bout of inflation. And the consistent theme with all these strikes is workers are asking for hefty pay raises. And in some cases they're getting it. Airline pilots got big pay raises. UPS workers got big pay raises. And so potentially for some workers, maybe they're gonna get the wage increases necessary to afford the higher prices. However, the problem is when you zoom out, you realize that only 10% of Americans' workforce is unionized right now, which is way down from its historical levels. Back in the 1960s and 70s, around 30% of American workers were in a union. Now it's one third that level today, which means that unions have way less power today in terms of broadly increasing wages across the entire economy and labor force. And sure enough, when we look at data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the wage growth for all workers is going in the wrong direction right now.
with weekly wage growth for American workers decelerating down to 3.9% year over year. That's now almost back at the long-term 60-year median. Now, what do you see here, folks? Wage growth spiked during the pandemic up to 7.5% year over year due to a severe labor shortage. But now that that labor shortage has eased, wage growth is going back down to a more normal level. You can see this is a very different situation than what occurred in the 1970s when wage growth literally was going at 8%, 7.5%, 9%, 10% for a decade. Wages for American workers went up 8 to 10% for a decade in the 1970s, which is what propelled that decade of inflation and allowed home prices and the prices of other goods and services to continue increasing it was that wage growth which fundamentally supported it. So you got to ask yourself, are we going to see that same type of wage growth this time around? And I think the answer so far is no. We're not seeing that type of wage growth, which means the quickest and easiest way to restore balance to the economy and balance to the housing market is for prices to go down. If prices go down, by say 30% for houses and maybe 20% for rent and 15% for gas and 20% for food, then all of a sudden the economy looks much healthier and the higher interest rates aren't nearly as big a deal. And this is something that I think a lot of you fundamentally understand. Because I pulled you all on my Twitter account and I asked you, what's the biggest problem in the housing market right now preventing you from buying a home? Is it home prices or mortgage rates? Two thirds of you, 66% said home prices are too high. Only one third of you said mortgage mortgage rates are too high. And you guys are actually right. Is mortgage rates, even though they feel high at 7.5%, they're actually not that high compared to history. You can see today we're at a 7.5% 30-year fixed mortgage rate. Might go a little higher in future weeks and months. But what do you see is that this is right actually at the long-term 50-year median, which is 7.4%. Now, of course, 7.5% feels high, but it's way higher than it was a couple of years ago in 2020 when it was 2.7%, higher than it was in 2010 when it was 4%, but it's actually right at that long-term average. And when you look at real mortgage rates, which takes the mortgage rate, subtracts the inflation rate, you can see we're also right at the long-term average. And so I don't anticipate mortgage rates to go down significantly due to the fact that they're at the long-term historical norm and due to the fact that the federal government just keeps borrowing money like a drunken sailor. So long as that's happening, mortgage rates are gonna stay at these levels, which makes some of the suggestions I'm seeing from certain political candidates out there very concerning. In particular, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who's an independent party presidential candidate for 2024, came out and said he wants to bring back the 3% mortgage rate, which could cut mortgage costs by $1,000 a month. And the way that RFK wants to do this is by making a mortgage available to Americans at 3% interest to first time home buyers who live and work in communities where they want to buy a home. But why don't I actually just let RFK explain this to you in the next 30 seconds. I'm gonna make a mortgage available to Americans at 3% interest. And I'm gonna do that without raising the debt. And the way I'm gonna do it, if you have a rich uncle who will co-sign your mortgage, you can get a very cheap mortgage because the bank is basing the interest rates on his credit score rather than yours. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm gonna give everybody a rich uncle. I'm gonna say Uncle Sam is gonna co-sign this new class of mortgages and guarantee them at 3%. That will lower the cost of mortgages by $1,000 a month. And of course, folks, this is a horrible idea. 3% uh, mortgage rates is what got us into the current mess we're in right now. The government artificially suppressed the rate of interest on mortgages. People piled into the housing market. It lowered inventory and caused prices to surge. One of the things that I think would happen if we did this is we would just see demand for starter homes from first time home buyers explode. The price of those homes would explode and very quickly the payment would no longer be lower. And the overall problem with RFK Jr's suggestion here is that you can't fix the current housing bubble by issuing more debt. That is not the solution. Rather, the solution is to try to figure out a way to get more inventory and supply on the housing market. That is the solution we need. And I actually have a couple ideas about how to accomplish that, with the first being changing the tax code to be less favorable to people who own real estate. Right now, if you're someone who owns your residential house or you're an investor, you get a lot of tax breaks from the US government that renters simply don't get. For instance, someone who owns a house with a mortgage 
mortgage, you're allowed to deduct the mortgage interest from your taxes, which is a huge incentive to get people to buy a house and continue to own a house. We should get rid of that. You should not get favorable treatment on your income taxes just because you're a homeowner. That's not fair to renters and it creates a distortion in the market where people don't have an incentive to sell. Additionally, the second thing I would do is I would get rid of the depreciation expense for real estate investors. Right now, if you're a real estate investor, you can use depreciation to lower your personal income tax bill, everyone. It's one of the reasons why 20 million homes in America right now are owned by a real estate investor. A lot of those homes sit vacant and don't really yield much income, but the investors, they don't care because they're taking the tax write-offs. If you get rid of those tax write-offs, I suspect you see a lot of investors list their homes. If only 5% of investors sold, that would be 1 million new homes on the market, which would double in inventory and cause prices to crash and make houses more affordable for the average American without having to increase debt. You guys can let me know in the comment section below what you think of my suggestion in comparison to RFK's suggestion. However, the broader thing that I'm just really trying to understand over the next one to two years is what's gonna be the path forward for the economy? Are we gonna see some type of disinflationary or deflationary recession or are we gonna see the US government continue to kick the can down the road on that recession by borrowing more and more money and making the debt bigger and bigger and bigger and making inflation worse? These are two juxtaposing forces that are battling with each other right now. And ultimately, one of them is gonna win out. We're either gonna have a deflationary crash where everything gets cheaper, the unemployment rate goes way up really fast, and there's a reset, probably a healthy reset for the economy in the long run, or we're gonna just see a slow, grind down through perpetual inflation, higher interest rates and increased debt. I'm gonna to talk to you more in future videos about what I think the end game is gonna be over the next year or two. So make sure you're a subscriber. Also make sure to hit the join button and become a channel member. If you become a channel member, you actually get access to exclusive videos that I don't release widely here on YouTube. I only release these to my channel members as part of my Real Estate and Economic 101 course where I cover in-depth topics on home prices and interest rates and macroeconomic movements. So if you're someone who's looking to step up your knowledge and education on the economy and housing market, hit that join button below. The cost is $5 a month and you can cancel at any time.